Yeah, gotta aim for the top like Hold up, yeah I can never doubt myself, I know better All of you critics be acting like you know better Blowing the smoke, but I know when it does settle Said I'm in my element, it's everything that this level to the game What's happening, people? Welcome back to the Athletes to Athletes podcast. Today, I am joined by the co-founder of A2A, Mr. Reed Meyer. Uh, just me and Reed going to be chopping it up today. We're going to discuss rev share and athlete pay, unlimited coaching staffs, as well as roster limits. That's something that I believe just kind of came out uh, today at the point of recording this. And then how all these things impact recruiting and, and admissions. Um, but first... It's great to be back on here with Reed. Obviously, uh, we have a ton of fun discussing a lot of these things. I was fortunate enough when we brought back the podcast, uh, was that two weeks ago, to be joined by by Steve Weish of NFL Network, uh, somebody that I consider a role model. And you know, it was a really great conversation with Steve. I loved getting a chance to kind of chop it up with him and, and kick off this new season with somebody of his stature that that brought in a ton of just knowledge and then great stories of how he broke stories. I think it was probably a little bit of a self-serving episode for me where I was able to ask questions of somebody that I watch a lot on, on TV and somebody that I've talked to kind of a handful of times between uh, Twitter DMs and then at the Black Sports Business Symposium. Um, so that was awesome to kick things off. And now we're going to be rolling into this. Sometimes it will be me and Reed. Sometimes it'll be me and Justin and Reed. Sometimes we'll bring in some people from the outside, still some coaches, journalists, different people that have an impact on the sport, uh, in the sports community. But Reed, good to have you back and good to be sitting down and can't wait to chop some things up with you today. Yeah, Ryan, happy to be back. I, I uh, can't claim to have the same pedigree as uh, your former guest, but hopefully we can we can have some good conversation here. Um, but yeah, man, I kind of want to flip the script on you a little bit. I know you usually end up starting with all the questions, but you know you've really dug your teeth into this the last couple of weeks and have really kind of focused on this this NCAA settlement that's come down the pipeline here. And just to kind of set the stage, can you just explain this settlement to me like I'm five years old? And just kind of help me understand what it all means. Yeah, the the um, as if we didn't think that the money was flowing into college sports before, the Brinks trucks are now backing up into college campuses. Not just one truck anymore. There's multiple, and that's really what I'm getting from this entire settlement. Um, firstly, there were three lawsuits, I believe four lawsuits going on. I don't know if there's been any news i haven't seen any news about that fourth one the fourth one being um a different lawsuit that dealt with kind of the same stuff but it was fontenot versus the ncaa and and they were like i said essentially suing for the same thing but they were suing in colorado whereas the other ones were all under the same jurisdiction in in a completely different state so they were able to consolidate all of those um, and and pull all of those together when it came to the settlement that's not even done yet, which is, you know, the most fascinating part of this is there's been a settlement, but it's not done yet because parties still have to agree on a lot of things. Um, but the three cases that were in there, the one that's getting the most pub is the house versus NCAA case. Uh, and it's a, it's an antitrust case. And there were, like I said, three of them, the other, the other two, were Carter versus the NCAA and Hubbard versus the NCAA, but all of them argued essentially the same points. So when they got a settlement uh, kind of agreed upon in the House versus the NCAA case, it just kind of collectively brought in the other two. And the Fontenot case was still left out because one is being argued in a completely different state, and it had a little bit of different elements to it but if the settlement for house versus ncaa actually does get agreed upon they will try to apply it to fontenot it kind of will set a precedent once everything is truly finalized um but there's some big numbers that are being thrown around when it came to this case firstly um i guess i should say secondly the number that was being thrown around was very eye-popping because it would have 
absolutely crushed the NCAA. It probably wouldn't, I mean, the NCAA probably would cease to exist. And, and from everything I was reading, NCAA would have had to file for bankruptcy. And that's because it was a, they were, they would have been liable for over 20 billion with a B dollars to these athletes. Um, essentially they settled for a measly 2.7 or 2.8 billion. Um, but all of that is, is going to be dished out to these athletes over a 10 year span. And the athletes that were part of it, that were part of the suit. Um, I believe there were what about 14,000 athletes that were part of it, even though house is the only name on there, um, under the suit and what it's been kind of deemed as, and what you can Google, I believe there were like 14,000 athletes that were in there. Um, that will be paid out over 10 years. And it's athletes from 2016 to 2020 before NIL even became a thing that were part of that lawsuit. However, athletes even past that will be able to recoup some of this money because now it's becoming rev share. And, you know, what the NCAA was trying to argue and hopefully I'm not rambling and going on tangents here, but what they were essentially trying to argue was that athletes weren't employees for the longest time. It's what we always heard. You know, their compensation is scholarships and books and room and board. And then, you know, it was that one athlete so many years ago talking about going to bed hungry. And then it was now free, uh, free food for athletes to make sure that they didn't have any other bad pub of basically saying that, you know, they, they had, you know, a bunch of children that were, were working in sweatshops, right? You're going to go out there and make us our millions and then we're going to send you to bed. Um, so there was a lot that were, that was part of it, but you know, there are athletes who are now in the NFL, who are now in MLB in, in, you know, the NBA who are part of this that are going to be getting paid and there's going to be a system to it where they're going to look at, you know, specifically for football, they're going to look at your career snap count to see how valuable you were to the team to deem what your market value was I included in that is going to be your player rating. You know, you, you hear, you know, my, my favorite coach in the, in the NCAA right now, Mike Norvell, you hear him talking about, you know, when his recruiters come back and they're not allowed to talk about how many stars a player has. So, you know, your, your, your different recruiters that are giving out, oh, this is a five-star recruit. This is a four-star recruit. Florida State isn't allowed to talk about that in their meetings, and Mike Norvell doesn't allow that. However, when it comes to market value, that's one of the criteria that they're going to be throwing in there of saying, okay, career snap count, what a player star rating was, and, and, kind of what, and, and a couple other things are going to go into what they're going to get paid. So it's a very huge case that, like I said, isn't settled yet. They, they came to a settlement. The Power Five conferences in the NCAA, and Power Five is very important in this, Power Five conferences in the NCAA approved the settlement. Now, the non-Power Fives weren't part of approving it. The lawsuit was basically deemed at those Power Five conferences that were coming up with, or at least doing a lot of the, the rev share with the CBSs, the NBCs, the, the ESPNs, and the NCAA. And those non-Power Fives, you know, they're left out in the cold. Now for this, the NCAA and the Power Fives are saying, oh, you know, the, the non-Power Fives, you're, you know, my, our, our group of fives, come on in. You know, you can come into the house for this and you're going to help us pay these athletes back. And those non-Power Fives are like, well, wait a second. None of this was aimed at us, right? None of this was supposed to be anyone coming for our heads when we're not really making these millions and billions of dollars every year off of any of um, any of these different deals. But now for this, they're bringing them into the fold, right? So, you know, and that's the crazy part is, you know, the, the breakdown of it is, you know, the, the power conferences would be on the hook for, what is it, 24%, I think it is, if I'm reading this right. Um, the NCAA is, is eligible for roughly 1.7 billion of it. Um, and then, or, or that's like 41%. And then the power fives are 24% of it. And then the non power fives are the rest of it. Right. So like there's a good portion 
that is going to be kind of hanging on these non power five schools that they're just like, hold on, you know, not sure that I want to be part of this at all. Right. Group of five schools will be 10% FCS schools will be 13%. And then there's some non football D one schools that are about 12% of this. So that's a very big chunk. That's not going, that's not being paid for by the schools that were the targets of this. So it's, it's like I said, there's a lot that went into this case and, you know, the, the settlement essentially when there is a settlement it has to go from the people that are settling over to the athletes, the athletes have to say, okay, we're good with it. And then it goes back to court courts like, okay, this is how it's going to break down. So, um, but with those non power fives and some of these non D ones, I'm sure there's going to be some pushback. They didn't even sign on for the settlement as well. So there probably is going to be some pushback with all of it. So that'll, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. It's, you know, this entire thing was, was over a month ago at this point, but there's still some fallout that's coming from it, but it, it's going to take a while. And, um, the back pay isn't probably going to start hitting until fall of 2025 as well. So there's a long time until we even get to kind of the meat of, of when this starts to hit. Yeah. And I think that's, to me, that's such an interesting component to this. Cause I mean, you know, you start talking about this and it's just amazing. It's like, it's like a Hydra. Every time you look back, there's another head, there's another element, there's something else that leans into it. And it does feel like, you know, for, for all the media attention that we've seen and all the headlines that we've seen where they make it sound like this is this established settlement and we've sort of solved the problem and we're ending these, these different pieces of litigation or different suits. To your point, this feels like just the starting block on a lot of this. And I, I want to kind of dive into a couple different elements of it because I think you, you spoke on a lot of different pieces and a couple of them require a little bit more, a little bit more conversation, in my opinion. But let's start with, you know, that that pay breakout that you talk about, right? So the NCAA and the Power Five conferences, one might argue the Power Four conferences now. I love the Pac-12, but there's only two of them right now. Yeah. Uh, you know, they they sort of got to go into the room where it happens, for lack of a better term, determine what makes sense, and then come back out and just looked at the rest of these schools that rely primarily on government and school subsidies to even pay for their operating budget for their mm-hmm. athletics department and say, hey, you're going to be on the hook for a significant percentage of this of this settlement that you didn't have really anything to do with or any say in. To me, that feels like the very first stopping point of not only, A, does that create an appeal opportunity for those schools to gather up and say, listen, we had nothing to do with this and we can't sustain this payment. We got to figure something out. To me, that's that's part A. And part B, does that not feel like kind of a line in the sand that we've seen in the NCAA between, you know, we've always talked about kind of this power five, power four, some, some people call it the autonomous four now because they do kind of operate in their own little space. Does this not feel like a bit of a line in the sand for those two sort of regions of college sports to say, okay, you know, these folks over here are operating on this budget, this plane, this existence. And then everything over here is arguably what, you know, the lay person sees or understands when they think of true college sports. Yeah. It's, it's funny you bring that up because there's talks about a power conference coming to fruition from this where you do have these big wallet schools, let's call them, you know, the big budget schools that can combine to create kind of this super conference and, you know, the, the rev sharing, the sponsorships, the ticket sales, you know, all of the, the major things that they have on, on, on a line, all the major line item type schools that can do those things create just one big conference where you no longer have to draw the line in the sand or, or have the sec president going on, uh, on, on, on TV and talking about, you know, there, you know, one of these things is not like the other is what I think he put it last year before, you know, Florida state was snubbed out of the playoffs. You don't have these lobbying types of things, right? You're going to, if you create this super conference and essentially have collective bargaining, it changes things, you know, because 
when you start to do rev share and mind you, NIL is still going to be a part of college football. Let's call it right. Like we say college sports, but college football is the one and, and it's an, and college basketball. Those are going to be the ones where, where the big rev share NIL deals are being made, you know, outside of the, the Livy Duns who, you know, are kind of the unicorns of the sports world where, you know, she has more traction than any football player to, to step on the field or any basketball player in March Madness. Those are always going to, to happen, right? Where you're going to have athletes that kind of transcend what their sport is because of the world we live in with social media and, and how they can create a buzz. But if you start to have these super conferences where the revenue is kind of collectively bargained, that line in the sand is ultimately drawn, you know, instead of it being drawn the way, you know, we're speaking about right now where the power fives are like, Hey, we can only, you know, we're just the, the lowly power five. We don't have all the, all this money. How about these non power five schools? And how about these other, you know, these other schools that there's more of them. So they should be, have to pay more, you know, there's more of them and there's less of us. So they should have to, bring their wallets together to pay a bigger chunk than just the, just the five of us when it doesn't make any sense. If you truly look at the math, right? Like the, we're, we're not, we're not worried about, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I'm watching James Madison on Saturday, you know, James Madison had a, a amazing season last year, but they're in, you know, a, a, a part of the, college football conferences that don't get the hype in the pub, you know, on Saturdays, we're not, you know, most fans aren't worried about the JMUs. They're not worried about the Richmonds. They're not worried about schools like that, that have a division one delineage, but don't have that CBS logo on their scoreboard, you know? So it's just very different. So yeah, I, I think that there is going to be a line drawn in the sand there, are, you know, there already is a proverbial line being drawn in the sand when it comes to payment of all this money, the, the 2.7, almost $3 billion over 10 years. It's going to be paid. There is a line being drawn in the sand, but I think there's going to be an even bigger one because there's going to be a serious power one conference where you're seeing, you know, the biggest and baddest to join. It's your Notre Dame's, your Ohio States, your Michigan's, USC, Florida State, you know, your your big time SEC schools, big time Big Ten schools, you know, Florida State, Clemson, maybe the only two teams you see come out of the ACC with them already trying to leave the ACC. You know, those might be the only two schools that you would see maybe in a big power conference. But ultimately, I really do think that there is a divide. And there has been a divide for a very long time. And it's going to continue to be separated now that there's a settlement, at least some something on the table that can make a very big tangible difference when it comes to the sports community, specifically the power sports and the revenue generating sports of football and basketball. Yeah, and I think you make a really good point there, especially, you know, in context of NIL and different things like that. I actually Funny enough, I, I did a, a presentation um, with with a group that that I work with. Who, you know, we talk about seventy eight percent of the kids who play sports in college right now don't play football or basketball. So only twenty two percent of the kids competing in college sports right now that's football and men's and women's basketball. Sixty seven percent of the NIL market share is football and men's and women's basketball. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's it, you're quite literally opposite pie charts and how that works. And exactly to your point, you know, the vast majority of kids that are involved in NIL, you have the Shadur Sanders, the Livy Dunn's, the Caitlin Clark's when she was in there. And these are these outlier individuals that exist in this space. And then everybody else kind of lives somewhere down in the middle, right? The average football deal, I think, is somewhere around $3,500. Gymnastics, funny enough, at the Division One level is about seven thousand. Everybody else outside of that, the average NIL deal that they're that they're signing is fifty three dollars. I mean, that's really it's it's two Jimmy John's sandwiches is really what yeah. it comes down to. If you're getting all the extras, you know. Yeah. But so 
you know, to your point, you know, I think we we can, you know, through the numbers kind of look at this settlement as, you know, football and basketball are really driving a lot of this, right? And so not only do we have sort of this conference divide, this division divide, you know, when, when we look at this, but we're also looking at a sport divide. And I think that creates an even more interesting delineation on here where, where do you draw those lines and where do you sort of cut these things off? Because I think that, yeah, to your point, if we looked at, you know, those main conferences, or if we looked at FBS football and said, listen, this could chop off right now and be its own thing, mm-hmm. I would agree with you. Um, the NCAA, you know, when I look at it on paper, it almost feels like it would be better for them to let some of these sports go and let some of these sports become sort of the business that they are and try to maintain kind of this very traditional amateur student athlete experience for all these other sports that don't have the same weight that they do. But then I think about men's basketball and the fact that that tournament pays for 95% of what the NCAA's operating budget is on an annual basis. And so thinking about, I mean, I'm not even sure how, and this is more of just kind of a him and a ha, but like, how would that even break? I mean, how does the NCAA allow that to to leave? I mean, they, I feel like their only option right now is to try and hold on to it to some capacity, but it feels like it's this, it's this rift that just keeps getting farther and farther away the more we get into litigation. They essentially have to stop lying about college sports not being a business, really. I mean, you know, the, the, the court cases where they are fighting to say that college athletes are not employees, yet they are the biggest line item in their end of the quarter or end of the year report is just insane. It's, it's just, you know, it's smoke and mirrors, right? So like, that's ultimately what needs to happen. And, you know, the, the funny thing, you know, for me, when I look at the NCAA or, or this NIL thing is some of your biggest stars, let's take out football, right? Like football, football, even before NIL, those, that's where your biggest stars were coming from. We used to have huge stars in men's basketball, but that's flipped on its head. And now it's, and now it's completely different, which I'm going to get to right, right now. Um, but you take out football. The sports that have probably the biggest impact when it comes to NIL and star power are women's sports. If and you know, we mentioned Livy Dunn, we mentioned Caitlin Clark, Angel Reese is in there, you know, Cameron Brink, like the rookie class that is now in the WNBA, and then you 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 know, you gotta throw in obviously Paige Paige Beckers, who's still in the NCAA, Juju Watkins. That's the part for me where everyone was so worried about, and they're still going to be continually worried about what NIL and RevShare does to the men's side of things. Oh man, what's going to happen, you know, in football where, you know, you have Oklahoma or Texas, you know, who's Texas, who's lining the, the, the streets of Austin here with Lambos um, when, when their, their recruits come in, what's going to happen when all this money is getting thrown around and, and this and that and that and this, and it's no longer fair. However, the biggest stars and the ones that are benefiting tremendously are the women, you know, Livy Dunn, Caitlin Clark, Angel Reese, Juju Watkins. They're the ones that had tremendous star power. And you're seeing that specifically on the basketball side of things, women's basketball side of things where they've taken that tremendous star power over to the WNBA. And, you know, I think, I think I saw some sort of stat and the Caitlin Clark effect is, is real. Um, but you know, when you look at these games, I mean, the aces have been selling out games for years, but now Indiana is selling out games in not just home games where a number of fans are lining up to see Caitlin and Angel Reese play. I mean, that, that rivalry that sparked, couple years ago in NCAA it's now traveling over to Chicago sky and Indiana fever and they are going head to head and and all of it is is going crazy I know I'm kind of on a tangent here but the the things that people really thought were going to affect college football which you know we are ultimately seeing athletes play at two and three schools I mean DJU is now the Florida State quarterback he was at Clemson he was at Oregon State and now he's at Florida State the things that people really thought were going to affect those things aren't affecting them as much as we thought, right? So 
I say all that to say this. When you look at this entire settlement, everyone's now saying goodbye to college sports. Amateurism is dead. Well, I'm sorry to tell you, but amateurism was never really a thing. Even the Olympics, who says it's the biggest amateur sports tournament in the world, has NBA players in it. The United States got tired of losing and said, we got to fix this. We're not just going to have amateur basketball players or college basketball players making our Olympic team. We got to fix this. So in came the dream teams, in came the magic and the bird, like in came these guys that we now know as legends. So amateurism has never really been a thing. Amateurism is, is high school at this point. That's when you're truly an amateur. So anyone that, that is clutching their pearls over this court case right now, thinking that it's going to change things tremendously, you're crazy because it's really not. It, it, it's not going to change things on the level that you think because the ones with the biggest wallets were already spending the biggest amount of money. Now they just have more money to play with. So they're going to continue to spend the most amount of money. Ohio State's going to continue to get the recruits. Florida State's going to continue to get the recruits. Michigan, Alabama, you name it, go up and down the line. The teams with the biggest and baddest wallets are going to continue to open those wallets up and bring people in. And that's never going to change no matter how many things you throw in here of or how much how much you clutch your pearls over oh my god college athletes can now go into the pros making millions of dollars honestly i think it's amazing that they can as long as they are getting some sort of financial literacy at the same time and i think most schools are doing that so we can stop having these conversations about professional athletes going bankrupt at a certain point because they have no financial literacy they can make money earlier on when they're 18, 19, 20 year old and then go into the professional ranks where they're making even more money or sometimes even the same amount of money now with how these NIL deals are going and how the rev share deals are probably going to go. But now they have the financial literacy behind it that they got when they were in college of how to manage things and how to do things because they had to. So while I understand that it is going to change recruiting and it is changing recruiting for a bunch of sports. I can tell you stories about wrestling where there are supposedly athletes being offered $400,000 type deals. And mind you, that's over the span of of a couple of years, but, and there's stipulations to that, but $400,000 is, is I can tell you for a fact been thrown at certain wrestlers that were in the transfer portal. I've gotten it, you know, from a number of people heard about it. So it's not just the football. It's not just the basketball. These other sports have these collectives and they have these big boosters that are going to start throwing money around even more because of things that are a part of this entire court case. And it's not just the money, but it's the roster spots. It's the, you know, it's the, the unlimited coaching staffs, the, the scholarship caps that are going to be happening that, they, we didn't have before. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think you made a really good point there. And I think for, for all of us that sort of, you know, we live and breathe and kind of, you know, exist in this college landscape, whether it be on the admission side, the sports side, a little bit in between for, for us and for everyone that we talk to, it almost just kind of feels like we're just saying the quiet part out loud now. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what this comes down to. And exactly to your point, I mean, they're, the level of amateurism that exists now, you just get to see it as opposed to the brown bag sitting in the apartment that somebody sublet for a kid. Now it's the Lambo lined up on the side of the, the road showing somebody what could be. So you may not like what it looks like when it comes out of the shadows, but it's what your team has been benefiting or not benefiting from since the days of the death penalty at SMU. I mean, that's just the reality of kind of what that looks like, certainly on a grand scale. And I think, you know, to your point on the wrestling piece, I do think it's 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 sports specific and it's program specific, right? If you go to Oklahoma State, Penn State, Iowa, I bet those are conversations that are happening with the wrestling team, right? Yes, they are. I bet if you go to Oklahoma and even Texas now, I bet there's some conversations happening about softball that aren't happening other places. 
Same thing with volleyball for Texas or Nebraska or Penn State. I mean, you look at these programs, these places that have been powerhouses for years have been powerhouses for years. And again, we're talking about these historic, storied, large title schools that have always kind of, you know, they've always been on TV. They've always had the large alumni bases. They've always had the big donor groups. You know, when we talk about places like Central Connecticut State, no knock on them as a school, but that's where you're going to get your more traditional college experience when everybody hit, you know sort of throws their head back and thinks about the good old days and all this kind mm-hmm. of stuff i mean that still exists in the vast majority of college sport and that's you know a lot of times what i talk about even with my kids right whenever we we start the conversation of okay so you want to play sports in college we're thinking about how we're going to set this up i have to add the first question that i ask most of my kids is what is your idea of college athletics do you want to play power four sports or do you want to play college sports and that changes the approach that we take because, first off, we're now eliminating a large chunk of the schools that exist if you tell me you want to be in Power 4. And that becomes arguably more of a business conversation at that point. We need to understand, are you good enough to do that? Does it make sense for, you know, can the, can you make the money makes it? You know, there's it's different. And there's only a finite, very finite number of kids where that conversation even makes sense. For 98, 99, statistically, you know, percent of kids, we're looking at normal college sports. And Mm -hmm. and that's what that existence is going to be. And I think a lot of families and a lot of boosters and a lot of alumni and a lot of people on the outside assume that, you know, when I meet with a kid or when anybody meets with somebody who's thinking about college sports, that it's just like it becomes like a contract negotiation. And that's not that's not what this is for the vast majority of kids And and for the people that that is akin to, to your point. I mean, that's going to happen whether we want it to happen or not. So let's put them in a structure and put them in an environment where they can learn financial literacy, where they can have support structures put around them to help them understand how to manage these different things, to be in a room with contract negotiations for a period of time. I think to to run away from it and pretend like it's ruining our college experience, I don't know if anybody in my purview, in my space, age, race, background, whatever, Nobody's turned off the TV on Saturday. No, they, you know it just for that is still what gets talked about. That is still what what everybody writes about. That is still what everybody watches. So clearly, it's not affecting you enough, and it's not affecting the quality or the the presentation enough for you to change what you're doing in that sense. So if that's the case, let's understand how we can make this better for everybody. In my opinion, and let's understand that again for a very very small percentage of the population in college athletics, this truly applies. You know, for everybody else, it's kind of business as usual. And by the time this settlement kind of, you know, I don't want to say fizzles out, but sort of, you know, settles at the bottom, there's a lot of things here that I think are going to look differently, right? I think to your point, I think those those non-Power 4 conferences are going to stand up and go, what are you talking about? We're not going to pay all this, and that's going to change. I think Charlie Baker is still... Very convinced he's going to get some sort of like new employment status created at the federal level for college athletes. That could change things and throw things on a wrench. Title IX. We haven't even had a conversation about Title IX when it comes to back pay or when it comes to, you know, being able to directly pay athletes. That hasn't even entered the conversation when it comes to to what we're going to do there. So the number of sort of pieces that still have a chance to kind of bite away at this thing I think it sounds good on a headline. I think it you know grabs people's attention. I do think some things are going to change, but college sports are college sports, man. Like that's you know the, my principal concern, and I would love to hear your opinion on this. Is you know the sports. I was a baseball player. You know you play football in college, but obviously wrestling's been a big part of your of your life as well. You know these sports that don't fall under these sort of like mega market sports, and even these mega market sports that don't fall under mega market conferences. You know, are those sports going to be affected from the funding on this? Are they going to have to move to a club process? Are we going to have to see Olympic model sports fall out of varsity funding at universities to help offset some of these payments or offset some of these expenditures that we've decided on? That, to me, is more the piece that I'm interested in. How how are we going to still create opportunity for kids that play in these sports that don't sign the big media deals or don't exist in the conferences that everyone knows every team and every, you know, ranking and every record and all that kind of stuff. What what's your opinion on that? It's inevitably going to hit the non-revenue generating sports or, you know, for for us the Olympic sports. Um 
outside of the fact that it's been said that, you know, track and wrestling are those types of sports that are on the, the chopping block, just look at, uh, there's a, there's a couple of articles that have come out and the, the athletic director at, I believe Illinois and Iowa state. So wrestling specifically, Iowa state was supposed to be working on a new wrestling facility as was Illinois. They've put a pause on that because of they don't know how things are going to impact financials. So the, millions of dollars that was slated for a new wrestling facility at Iowa state or at Illinois. And I've been to both of those schools, Illinois, uh, wrestling facility. They have a wrestling locker room. It's basically like it. I mean, unless that part has changed, it wasn't much of anything. Um, the wrestling room is still the same where they're rolling out mats in an old banquet hall that they have on campus. Um, so it wasn't really a designated wrestling room at Illinois. And that's a big 10 program. And that's a big 10 program. Um, you know, when I was there, it was, I believe like right in that time span of the, the basketball player talking about going to bed hungry. So they had to scramble to take one of their dining halls and make it a, an athlete only dining hall, uh, on campus. And it was like the furthest away from everything because it was, I mean, it wasn't, I shouldn't say the furthest, but it wasn't really like it was like in the middle of the quad, right? It wasn't the, 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 the normal one. Um, it was, it was something that they, and it was just like an extra banquet hall. They couldn't renovate it and make it all pretty like athletes are used to, right? Like it was one of those things. Um, but they are, you know, wrestling is, and, and these other Olympic sports are most definitely being kind of zeroed in on when it comes to how much money is going to be spent on them for, for some schools. Um, the, the Iowa's Iowa is, Iowa has, I believe a $25 million, uh, new facility that's being built and they've been working on it for a while and they have, crazy amounts of money when it comes to just wrestling specifically to spend. Um, so there, you know, there's not going to be much of a stop on that, on that gravy train. You know what I mean? Like that, that their new facility is going to be built. Now, like I said, the one at Iowa state and the one at Illinois, there's already been articles and news that has come out. The AD at, at Iowa state, I was just watching his video where he was talking about, we don't know what's going to happen. So we have to figure out our financials before we can move forward on some of the projects that we want to move forward on, which is wholly unfair, right? Like you have teams and Iowa state's a very good wrestling team. I mean, they had an NTA champion again last year. Um, he's now a multiple time NTA champion. Um, and their facility is, very nice. I mean, they have a, they have a pretty nice wrestling room there, but they deserve a new one, right? They deserve to, to get, I mean, I, I will never say that a team doesn't deserve to have a very nice wrestling room. Wrestlers are gritty characters. So, you know, you roll out a mat in a dungeon and they're going to scrap, but like you want to I mean, it's, it, you know, when it comes to recruiting in, in every stretch of the imagination these days, it's an arms race. You know, you want to have the gorgeous facility for your guys to relax in, to, practice in to lift weights in something that they can essentially call a home away from their tiny apartment that they have on campus. Right. So, you know, you have to have those things. Um, but to get back to your point, yeah, I mean, they are definitely going to be on, on the chopping block when it comes to how revenue is going to be kind of dispersed among campus. And it's already being said of like, what's going to happen with your athletic facilities for these non-revenue generating sports, these Olympic sports. Um, you know, and, and, you know, my thought as soon as I heard that was there are certain schools, UNC being one of them, where they have a gym that is for Olympic sports only, where it is not a football, it is not a football gym. It is for Olympic sports only. And the funny thing about it is it's attached. It's in the football stadium. It's a, it's attached to the football stadium. It walks right out into the end zone. Um, 
is where their their this non Olympic or this Olympic uh, weight room is. So that's the funny part about those types of things is there are specific Olympic things and Olympic facilities that certain schools have that who knows what will happen to them, right? Will, will that cease to exist? Will they continue to have that? Because being on the chopping block are, are potentially these Olympic sports that are being subsidized and paid for by the basketballs, you know, the, the footballs, the, the everything else that is happening. I mean, over the last couple of years, football at UNC has been very good to stay on the track with UNC. Basketball, we know what basketball has done at UNC for years and years to come and what the legacy there is with Michael Jordan, right? So that is tremendous. And what's going to happen with those facilities if you start looking at these Olympic sports and saying, man, I don't know if we can keep a volleyball team. You know, I don't know if we can keep a wrestling team. I don't know if, you know, the the track team is hasn't really won a, a conference tournament in a while and you know they're taking up some money that we might be able to you know redistribute over here i mean i'm sure that there's a number of schools that are already looking at redistribution that are already trying to figure these things out you know i i read that somewhere that before the settlement even happened texas a&m let 15 people go in their athletic administration you know, that's, that's a big chunk of people that you're going to redistribute salaries to and change some things up. So, you know, what's happening within these athletic departments where they're going to have to shift some things around because NIL and, and schools can now pay NIL and there's rev share that's also going to be brought in. So it's going to be very interesting. I'm hoping to God as somebody who, you know, covers wrestling that things don't happen to these Olympic sports. Think of all the all the hype happening right now with Olympic sports. Like the, we're we're at this point five six weeks away from the Paris Games, and there is a tremendous amount of buzz going on. I mean, we just watched the you know the the Olympic team, the track Olympic team, be solidified. The swim team be solidified. Those are incredible moments that we've been able to watch over the years of Michael Phelps becoming an absolute legend in the sport, Katie Ledecky becoming an absolute legend in the sport, you know, and I've obviously watched a number of wrestlers become absolute legends in, in the sport. You know, the, the David Taylors, the Kyle Dakes, the Jordan Burroughs, you know, these guys have left their mark on the, on these sports. And it, they came through the NCAA system where they were, highly sought after recruits and became multiple time champions. So it's a, essentially a feeder program for our Olympic teams are these NCAA facilities. So something is going to have to be kind of brokered. If you ask me, maybe between these, these different NCAA schools and these governing bodies to say, this system is working. We can't, we don't want to break the system when it comes to these sports because then we're not collecting the Olympic medals, which is a huge deal. It is a absolute huge deal, right? So, you know, hopefully things change for the better when it comes to the things that are being said about these Olympic sports, but it's, it's, it's certainly going to impact them in the future. Yeah. I think you make a really good point. The, the, you know, we, we phrase them as Olympic sports or non-revenue sports or whatever it is. But, man, every two years we really seem to care about those sports, especially as as, as Americans. And, mm -hmm. you know, to your point, I mean, it's, it's, it's far more than just the sports that they're playing, right? It's the, it's the impacts that sort of go beyond that geopolitically and, and pedigree and all that kind of stuff. But, yeah, I think, I think that, you know, that would almost have to be, in my mind, what happens, right? We'd have to see, you know, America is one of the few sort of dominating countries in the Olympics that doesn't have a centralized process for Olympic development, right? We've allowed the NCAA in, in many cases to sort of run that, mm -hmm. and it's worked really well for us. We have a lot of programs. There's a lot of places to develop. Those NGBs, you know, they do the best they can, but most of them are nonprofit. They don't really get a lot of support in a lot of places. So exactly to your point, I mean, I can see, you know, if we start to lose opportunity at the college level for those sports, does the NGB step up? Does Congress step up and say, oh man, we didn't realize this was going to, you know, kind of happen on the back end. We need to fix this. 
does their you know, is there sort I of think a natural Congress is going to have a big role, honestly, when you mention Congress. I think they're going to have a big role in this, um, just in the fact that the NCAA is going to look to them and say, hey, we just got hit with this billion dollar antitrust suit. Um, from what I'm reading, the NCAA is going to look to, to get some of these antitrust exemptions. So I think Congress is going to play a big role. I completely agree. Completely agree. And I think it, to your point, you know, it, it kind of goes beyond. They're going to look at this infrastructure, these sort of staples of, of the American culture, right? College sports, Olympics, whatever it might be, and realize that, you know, that first domino is going to fall. They're going to see where that projects. And, and you know, there's a reason why the NCAA had a former politician start to run the NCAA, right? Mm-hmm. That That's not by accident. That's there's There's a reason why Charlie is where Charlie is. So it's going to be interesting to see... You know, I, I don't want to call it necessarily fear mongering because I do think there's elements of that that really can domino into a spot that that hurts our sports in a certain capacity. But, you know, kind of bringing it back to the beginning point that you said, you know, this is this is the start line. This isn't you know, they, they keep phrasing it as a settlement. But, man, this is the this is the kickoff right here. Now we really get to see how all the how all the chips fall and, and really what these you know power four conferences do, what. Congress does what the NCAA does, what all of what every other college institution in America does who doesn't fall under this, you know, two hundred million dollar revenue model like LSU does. You know that that that's really where this is going to kick off. I'm I'm excited to see it. I think I do think ultimately it's going to end up better for college sports. I almost think you almost you kind of have to have one of these rumbles or jumbles to kind of figure out what fits and what doesn't. I just hope that. We're not nearsighted in those decisions and cut off opportunities for, you know, what has become, you know, peanut butter and jelly. College sports and college universities in the U.S. are inextricable, and and we we can't take that away, in my opinion. Yeah, and the the funny thing, and it's something that we're we're seeing is they're starting to attach these new rules to their their old settlements, I guess I should say, or their, their old decisions, right? Reggie Bush gets his Heisman back. And why does he get his Heisman back? Because the new rule set is like, wow, we were probably really stupid and short-sighted when we did that, right? And it, it should have never happened in the first place, but they're, you know, they're going to, a lot of these things are, is the NCAA having to retroactively go back and say, damn, we were wrong or, Oh shit, we should have probably never did that in the first place. Um, or them trying to fight to not have to pay for all of these things, right? Like they didn't want to end up paying almost $3 billion to, to athletes and back pay over the next 10 years. Like, I mean, they are, like I said at the beginning, they ultimately settled because 20 billion is a hell of a lot more money than, than three, as well as splitting three with, you know, the, power four conferences and, and the, the non power four conferences, right? Like that's a, that's an easier, uh, crow sandwich to, to choke down than anything. Right. So I think it's going to be, I don't think much changes, honestly. I don't think that recruiting changes. I think that the teams, and I said this already, teams that have the money are going to continue to spend the money. The, Schools that have the money to have something closer to these unlimited coaching staffs and hit their roster limits, they're going to do that, right? Your analyst, your analyst role can now coach on the field and on game day. And I mean, that was a trickle down that, that will most likely trickle down to other sports, but it's starting in football where your analyst jobs are guys that can just be analysts and be in meetings and say, okay, we're the, the passing analysts. We're, we're this type of coordinator and we're doing this, this, and this. Now they are actually coaching those linebackers. Your quarterback will most likely have a personal coach when it comes to this, right? Like this is my guy. Maybe, I mean, hell, you might even see an Arch Manning type say, this is my quarterback coach. I'm coming here. I want to, I want to be, bring him with me, right? Like this is my guy. So who knows if, if that will happen? I don't know. I mean, I'm speculating, right? Where your, your biggest stars have their own personal coaches and they make them an analyst and they pay them 
some sort of stipend or whatever. But it's going down that road where, you know, you're kind of taking the gloves off. And let's call it what it is. When it comes to all of these rule changes, the NCAA essentially wanted to have order when it came to sports. And that order was you play the games, we collect the money, we can give you scholarships and, and, and some table scraps and, you know, and, and an opportunity to get to the pros. And as time has gone on, you're seeing NIL, you're seeing rev share, you're seeing, you know, amateurism just dwindle more and more to the point where the order that I should say order that, uh, you know, with air quotes that NC, the NCAA wanted to implement is going away and it's fading away, which is ultimately a good thing. But when these things fade away, the NCAA says, okay, that's how you want it. And they just open the floodgates and allow it to happen, which is something we saw with NIL where the floodgates opened up and there weren't too many restrictions. And they retroactively came in and said, that's a sanction. That's a sanction. That's a sanction. You can't do this. You can't do this. You can't do this because they realized that, you know, the, the, the envelope full of money was now on top of the table and wasn't getting handed underneath and it looked very bad. So like I said, they retroactively came in and said, okay, we need to clean some of this stuff up, but it's what they wanted. They wanted those floodgates to open up so they could see everything out in the open and say, okay, these are the things we want to keep. These are the things we want to, we want to get rid of. And now that's what's going to happen here with RevShare is they're going to enter into these contracts. And I ultimately hope that there's collective bargaining and that we do start to see the professional ranks and the college football ranks. I, I should just say the student athlete ranks. I'm not even going to call it the amateur ranks anymore. The student athlete ranks and the professional ranks start to merge a little bit more to become one. They're already doing it with the game where this year – you know, quarterbacks and, and I think one guy on defense will have the green dot on the helmet and we'll be able to hear the coaches during games. So that's going to be changing this year, I believe this year. And I know they're already experimenting with it throughout the spring and they've been able to work with it. But that's something obviously that we see in the pros that is now going to transition into the in the college game. I'm hoping that these things start to make a change and matriculate down to the college ranks where you, you have an NCAA PA, right? You have more collective bargaining. You have representation where you're coming to the table and you're saying, okay, the student athletes get this from this deal with ESPN or this deal with CBS or this deal or this deal, you know, and every year those deals have to be kind of restructured because ESPN just signed that deal where they now have, you know, what is it, the, the, the college football playoff deal that they have. So you're going to have to enter into some sort of deal every year with these schools where they're getting some chunk of the revenue or whatever else so that things are going to continue to drastically change. But I ultimately think that they need to get into a room. There needs to be some collective bargaining. There needs to be somebody on behalf of the players that is only looking out for the player's interest to speak up on, on their behalf, because if not, I mean, hell, we already have an NCAA, right? And there was never any spokesman on behalf of the athletes in the past. And you see what happened there. We got amateurism and hungry athletes only to then, you know, transition into what we have now. So hopefully things do start to look a little bit more like the pro game. Everybody already says that the transfer portal is essentially free agency in itself anyway. So Let's make things look a little bit more seamless to the point where when our athletes move on from the college ranks to the professional ranks, things still look the same to the point where they're, they're saying, okay, this is a contract that I had in college. This looks like the same contract that I now have in, in, in pros. They're already working with agents. They're already working with these people. They're taking the classes that they need to take in college so that they're ready for it. If we're going to you know, hand over millions of dollars, prepare these athletes to handle millions of dollars, prepare them to read a contract, to have financial literacy, to know what's a good investment, to know where their money needs to go. Because learning that later on in life, I mean, it, it sucks. I mean, we can all be a testament to that. Like learning it on the fly is horrible. I'm still not good with money, right? Like, it's just like, oh no, yeah, I like that pair of sneakers. I'm going to go buy it, right? You know what I mean? So allow these, these kids when they are kids to learn 
things that they're that are tangible, things that they are going to take from one walk of life into the next. Yeah. No notes. Couldn't have said it better myself. You got to close us out on that. That's yeah. that's it right there. Yeah, I mean, this has been fun. I love it. I love getting into these different types of conversations. We will be bringing the A2A podcast to you guys twice a month. Bi-weekly is what we're going to be coming with all these different topics because by then we'll have enough time to, one, research them, two, understand them, and three, there'll be enough news out there about it to the point where we can really sink our teeth into it as well. We will also be bringing you some different coaches, different people within the sports community to speak on some of these things. Sometimes it'll be an interview with me. Sometimes it'll be an interview with Reed and some of the people that are part of his atmosphere as well. So this has been an awesome conversation, Reed. I love this. I can't wait for Justin to to rejoin us. I know he was, I believe what, on a little bit of a vacation. He's celebrating his birthday, things like that. So schedules need to sync up a little bit here. But it's going to be awesome here on the A2A podcast. We'll see you guys again next time.